afternoon and thank you for joining our virtual presentation today. This event is our yearly collaboration between the Frank Islam Ateneum Symposia and the annual Bella Mishkinsky Memorial Lecture, which is presented by the Paul Peck Humanities Institute. I'm Dr. Fiona Glee, Dean of Communication Studies, English Language for Academic Purposes and Linguistics. On behalf of Germantown Campus, Vice President and Provost Margaret Latimer, and as the curator for the Ateneum series, I'm honored to welcome you all today. And with deep respect, we gratefully acknowledge the native peoples on whose ancestral homelands Montgomery College sits, as well as the diverse and vibrant native communities who make their home now in Montgomery County. This distinguished speaker series is made possible through a gift from philanthropist and civic leader, Mr. Frank Islam. This year, our speakers are all exploring the timely theme of advocacy, activism, and public engagement. A powerful philosophy created by Mr. Islam drives the Ateneum Symposia. If you conceive it, you believe it, you can achieve it. You can find more information about our program and you can view recordings of previous speakers by visiting the Montgomery College Ateneum website. Our presentation today is being recorded and will be available on the website soon. Before we go on, I want to recognize the work of outstanding colleagues who made this event happen. Our technology experts, Mr. Stan Jones and Mr. Arkar Kyo Nguyen, Ms. Kaylin Nguyen, who coordinates the admin, Dr. Ken Jassy, Professor of Art History and Coordinator for the Portraits of Life Holocaust Exhibition and Educational Program, and Professor Sarah Ducey, who is the College-wide Chair for Integrative Studies and is Director of the Paul Peck Humanities Institute. And now I'm delighted to pass the mic to Professor Ducey. I'm Sarah Ducey and welcome to our seventh annual Bella Mishkinski Memorial Lecture. I wanna tell you briefly about Bella and um, it helps you to know the origins of this lecture series. Bella was a Holocaust survivor. She was born 99 years ago this September in uh, Woods, Poland. She came to the United States in 1946 and lived for many years here in Montgomery County before she retired to Florida. She was active as a volunteer at the US Holocaust Memorial Museum and also for our College Alumni Association. She had very deep ties to our college and to our many faculty, staff and students. In fact, Bella was one of our students. She and her husband, Hank Bermanis, enrolled in Dr. Myrna Goldenberg's course called Literature of the Holocaust. It's a little funny, but she told Dr. Goldenberg the reason she was taking the class was to make sure that Myrna did it right. She was reassured by her experiences in that classroom and later committed to a legacy of Holocaust scholarship here at MC. Her gift to the college supports this lecture and other Holocaust education programs. This lecture series, the Bella Mishkinsky Memorial Annual Lecture, helps our students to make uh, to understand history and to make relevant connections across time, across disciplines, into their own lives, into their actions. And I think you'll find today that people are gonna learn a lot about how they might choose to act moving forward. At this time, I'd like to introduce Professor Ken Jassy, Coordinator for Holocaust Education at Montgomery College. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Hope everyone can hear me. Um, Professor Jassy, um, teach art history at the college and I coordinate the Holocaust education programs at Montgomery College and between the college and the Montgomery County community. And I wanted to mention just very briefly uh, a few of the things that we do, uh, which include the, um, as you've heard about the Bella Mishkinsky lecture, the annual Holocaust commemoration will take place in the spring semester, the Portraits of Life exhibit and education program, which we particularly share with the Montgomery County Public Schools, but also in other public and private settings. And I also arrange for Holocaust survivors to speak in educational settings. If this is something you would like for your classes, and it'd be virtually for now, um, please get in touch with me. My email 
is K-E-N dot J-A-S-S-I-E at Montgomery College EDU, and be glad to hear from you. Um, but enough of what I'm doing. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our feature speaker, Mr. Doran Isaacson, uh, who has a background in law, and he came to the Anti-Defamation League in 2017 as the regional director of the DC office. Uh, he's currently the vice president of the ADL's Midwest and Mid-Atlantic divisions. The ADL was founded in 1913, and since that time has worked to combat anti-Semitism and all forms of hate, which is as timely now as it was more than a century ago. Before I turn things over to Mr. Isaacson, I wanted to mention that you, if you have any questions at any time during the program, please type them into the Q&A box, which you should find at the bottom of your screen. And I will relay them to the speaker after the talk when we'll have some time for discussion. Again, you don't have to wait until the end to post your questions as I'll be monitoring, monitoring the Q&A during the program. Okay, without further ado, let's begin the conversation on understanding and responding to contemporary anti-Semitism. Duran? It's a, a pleasure to be here, uh, notwithstanding the very serious topic that we will engage in together. I wanna to say at the outset, uh, that educating and challenging ourselves to understand the various forms of hate that exist in the history of humanity as well, unfortunately, as in our, our current society is a basic responsibility of all citizens. And for each of you that are here today, I say thank you. Thank you for your curiosity. Thank you for your commitment to understanding uh, and to continuing your learning uh, in this most important uh, critical issue that defines who we are as a country and increasingly defines uh, the sources of our division uh, and unfortunately even of violence. So let me also note uh, that I am here uh, on this, the 83rd anniversary of Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass, where uh, the Nazi German regime started to gather at that particular moment, 30,000 men and send them to camps, destroyed synagogues, destroyed homes, Jewish businesses. It was a turning point in what was to become the Holocaust, the attempted genocide of the Jewish people in Nazi Germany. And it is perhaps fitting that we are here discussing the state of anti-Semitism in contemporary America, contemporary terms on that very anniversary. I'd like to begin with just a quick question, a quick poll that I ask you to please uh, indicate your answer. Uh, these, are, these are anonymous. I just wanna do a little level setting about our collective knowledge of what we are gonna discuss today. So please pick a broad consensus, not unanimous, but a broad consensus that anti-Semitism has occurred for thousands of years and still occurs today. That is the subject uh, of my remarks today, is to tie the millennia, the centuries, the persistence of anti-Semitism in various forms and bring it forward to society today. <clears throat> it is true. And we will examine the origins, the manifestations, and what you each could do in your own day-to-day -day life, <clears throat> in your studies, in your work, uh, to be part of the resistance to the reemergence of this among the oldest hates known to humankind. Next slide, please. As Ken mentioned, the ADL, the Anti-Defamation League, was founded in 1913. Our organization was founded around the lynching of a Jewish businessman in Georgia who was wrongly accused of, the, of a murder. And at that time, the founders of the organization recognized that there was growing hate in America, growing or sustained racism and violence, ongoing violence against uh, people of color, 
against Chinese immigrants, um, among minority groups, uh, however defined. And the inspiration for the beginning of the Anti-Defamation League was to stop the defaming of Jews, to stop spreading conspiracy theories and allegations about Jews that resulted in violence and in ostracization of the Jewish population, and to secure justice and fair treatment for all. This mission, this integrated mission, was at our founding, and it continues to this day to inform the work that we do across our 26 offices in the United States and offices in Europe and in Israel. Next slide, please. This dual purpose, this notion of a responsibility uh, to the Jewish community and a responsibility to the broader community is rooted in one of the teachings from a volume called The Ethics of Our Fathers by a sage rabbi, Hillel, uh, that is the namesake of the campus organization, Hillel, uh, that is a gathering place uh, for Jews across campuses. And when asked what the role, what the moral responsibility is of a citizen, of an individual, the reply of Hillel was to reflect on the following. If I am not for myself, who will be for me? The sense of responsibility for one's own self and one's own community. If I am only for myself, what am I? This broader ethical duty to humanity, to people around us more broadly. And if not now, when? A call to action. The obligation is not in the future. The obligation is not somebody else's. The obligation for us to be for ourselves, to be for others, exists every day. And it's a call to each of us to be engaged in the good work of building civil society and protecting minorities uh, of every kind. Next. A moment on ADL's work. Our work focuses on three components of what we call fighting hate for good. The first is our investig investigatory capability. We monitor every extremist group, every hate group across the United States and many internationally with subject matter experts on our center on extremism. We put out reports, we monitor potential plots and report those to appropriate authorities. We also have a center on technology and society which is tackling the particular challenge, which we will come back to later, of the internet and social media as an accelerant to hate. We also advocate, we believe in public policy at the local, the state, the federal level as being critical to us being able to build the infrastructure to continue to combat hate in our country. An example of that is the hate, the, the uh, Jabir, uh, hate Act, uh, Shepard uh, uh, Jabbar Hate Act that just passed uh, Congress this past year. Uh, we we advocate for legislation requiring Holocaust and genocide education. Uh, we advocate for security funding for religious institutions across denominations and many other things. And finally, the hope part of our agenda, our hope against hate, is our education. We are in kindergarten. We are in primary schools. We are in uh, middle schools and high schools, we are on campus helping to empower students to learn that their schools should be no place for hate, that the power of America of the great experiment is our individual rights, even our right to disagree, but to maintain our views and maintain our interactions through an openness to understand that our diversity is our strength and that we must affirmatively educate on an ongoing basis to prevent people resorting to, as they have all too many times in history, scapegoating and calls for violence or for singling out of others on the basis of difference alone. Next, please. So let's turn to the topic at hand, which is anti-Semitism. It's critical that we understand and we have a shared understanding of the definition. Anti-Semitism as is noted on the slide, is a form of prejudice. And it is it targets both individuals 
and generically Jews as a group. Critically, it is based on stereotypes and myths that target Jews as a people, as a race, as having certain characteristics, and it targets religious practices and beliefs that are viewed as somehow harmful to society. It is based, and we will explore in detail, on contemporary and historical tropes, insults, conspiracy theories, characterizations that cast Jews as inherently untrustworthy, disloyal, alien, greedy, or somehow polluted. And in its one of its more recent manifestations, it delegitimizes, demonizes, or applies a double standard to Israel. And we will come back to Israel as a topic of much discussion. You will note that there is a standard here. It is not any critique of Israel is anti-Semitic, but the delegitimization, the demonization, and the application of double standard, which themselves are themes in history, in many countries, when regimes target Jews, um, is anti-Semitic. And we, again, we will come back to that topic. Next. I want to set the context for this conversation by bringing us back for a moment, for a few moments, to a seminal event, that being the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, which was the last of several rallies held in the spring and summer of 2017. I want to tell you that this, we're going to show you a video, and it may be disturbing to some. So please understand that there is language here that is very disturbing. And this is a production of Vice News, who embedded a reporter with the folk, the extremists that showed up in Charlottesville in the summer of 2017. Let's play the video, please. Sadly, the police were not ready the next day, and we lost Heather Heyer, one of the protesters who, as you will recall, was run down by a, pro by a member of the extreme right. Just last week, the trial of those responsible began in Virginia, here four years later, with the hope of some reckoning for those people who organized what will go down as an historic day in our country. And what I want you to note from Charlottesville is the theory that underlies the chant, you will not replace us, Jews will not replace us. This was the coming out, if you will, of the replacement theory among far-right extremists. The replacement theory, which we will examine a little bit later as well, is a conspiracy theory that suggests that Jews are in charge of a conspiracy to facilitate the entry of immigrants from Central and South America, to empower African Americans to rise up, to empower people, members of the LGBTQ plus community, the Asian American community, that it, this is a Jewish conspiracy. We're mobilizing minorities to replace the white race in America. This is an active theory. It is an animating and motivating belief to this day. It has resulted in more violence. And that, that intersection between the role of Jews and anti-Semitism and anti-Black racism and every other form of hate is what I hope you will take away from today. That this hate, anti-Semitism, is the oldest hate, and it is central to the white supremacist theory that justifies violence against all minorities. And therein lies the shared purpose of all minorities in America, religious, racial, gender, gender identity, gender preference, every, by every definition, 
for why we need to understand each other's history, each other's stories, each other's oppression, in order to unite in the name of a better America. Next slide, please. So where does this idea of Jewish control, of a Jewish conspiracy to replace white people come from? Well, it is the latest iteration of one of those tropes that I mentioned to you. And we at ADL, and over the course of the 100 plus years of fighting this fight, and with the benefit of scholars and history and the shared experience of most people who are Jewish, have identified seven of the most common tropes. They are that of Jewish power, the notion that Jews yield disproportionate power secretly, that Jews are disloyal, that their loyalty is not to their country, it is to Israel, or it is to uh, their own as if they are not real citizens of a country. It is of Jewish greed. It is of the allegations of or the deicide, the killing of, of Christ that was taught and unfortunately in some quarters still is taught for millennia. It is of the blood libel, the allegation from medieval times that at the Passover, not the Paschal lamb, but rather young Christian children's blood was used as a symbol of Jewish memory. The irony of that is enormous, the Passover, is a celebration of deliverance from slavery, not of abuse. And yet the blood libel, the idea of Jews somehow victimizing children continues to this day. And then the two modern tropes, Holocaust denialism, the notion that actually the Holocaust didn't happen, it wasn't as bad as the Jews say, this is a manipulation of history, and finally, anti-Zionism, the notion that Jews have no right to self-determination, that Israel itself is an Ill illegitimate or Zionism is an illegitimate racist construct that must be resisted. And incredibly, that Jews themselves are, are somehow Nazis. That latest perversion, I will show you more about. But it's very critical to understand when you think about what is the challenge of anti-Semitism today, what animated all those white people to march on the University of Virginia and chant that Jews will not replace us, Jews who are 2% of the population of the United States, that somehow it is the Jew who is the threat, is rooted in this history, the history of these tropes. And it is critical for you to be an ally to Jewish friends, to Jewish family, to understand this is the shared history, experienced in different ways by most Jews, not always talked about, but it is at the root of Jewish experience over generations and generations and generations. Next. In addition to the seven tropes, we've identified seven key features of anti-Semitism. The first is what I referenced, is that it is enduring. It is the oldest hatred. Second, it is highly adaptive. It adapts to whatever the social or political or religious context where it is being applied. The justifications are often paradoxical, and I'll give you some examples. And it is lethal. It is lethal in ultimately in the ultimate tragedy that is the Holocaust. And it is lethal at Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where 80 and 90 year old worshipers on the Sabbath were murdered in their pews 
for no other reason than they were there as Jews during the Sabbath. Anti-Semitism can be over or covert, implicit. It can be conscious and I will argue subconscious. And it is also critical to understand that it is the canary in the coal mine in democracies. It is a warning. When anti-Semitism is rising, so are other forms of hate, so is illiberalism, so is fascism. And it's, it's political. Let's go through these in a little more detail. The oldest hate. The notion of Israel, of Jews being a nation unto themselves, we can see in Exodus, where it is reported that the Pharaoh viewed Jews as a potential enemy from within. Based on polling that we do globally, 41% of the population polled today believe Jews are more loyal to Israel than to the country in which they live. This is based on a global poll that we did in dozens of countries. So this persistent not, notwithstanding Jews living for generations and serving in military and serving in government service and being part of a community and being an ally to others, there remains this suspicion among many. Next. It is highly adaptive. During the, the George Floyd tragedy, we saw some suggest that the police that murdered George Floyd or, and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery were somehow trained by the Israeli military, trained to oppress people of color. And then on the other side, it's a conspiracy that the police actually are not even from Minneapolis. They're supported by Antifa and George Soros, who has become the living symbol of Jewish power in, among haters. The fact that simultaneously haters on the left and haters on the right can somehow navigate back to Jews as the reason, as at fault, is as strong an example of how perverse and adaptive anti-Semitism is that we can think of in current times. And so it can be like a chameleon. It can change its worldview. It can change the side it's on. It can be simultaneously opposite things. Next. It is paradoxical. Over the centuries, Jews are blamed for all the evil inherent allegedly in capitalism and simultaneously for being the originators and the progenitors of socialism and communism. Jews are, are alleged to be too pacifistic and not willing to defend their own nation where they live, part of that dual loyalty charge, and as militaristic warmongers. They are too nationalistic or they are rootless. They are racist or they are behind multiculturalism. They are too insular. They stick to their own kind or they represent a current threat to the purity of white Christian America, pick your country, pick your religion through assimil assimilation or miscegenation. And there are cries here in America simultaneously in, in Europe and Latin America and Africa elsewhere, go back to Israel, go back to Palestine, go back to where you came from and get out of Israel, get out of Palestine. It is not where you belong. Next. And anti-Semitism has particular forms and particular impact. There need not always be intent. It can be unconscious. It can be internalized and spread through simple jokes, through characterizations, through 
individual interactions that then become generalizations. It is like any form of bias or prejudice. And so things can be anti-Semitic in intent, but also without intent, but in impact. It is part of the air we breathe. Here's a quote from a very well-known and distinguished queer feminist author, Barbara Smith, who acknowledges that the anti-Semitism she found in herself was something she, she absorbed in the interactions, the daily communications, the literature, the stereotypes that she's absorbed to simply by being. Next. And as I referenced, anti-Semitism is most definitively lethal. Whether, and we can point to almost any country in which Jews have lived since the exile from Israel and point to an ultimate violent purge or to violence on an ongoing basis. I'll bring you back to Pittsburgh. We just celebrated or, or commemorated the anniversary of the loss of the Tree of Life victims. I like to say their names. I want to say their names so that we remember. They were Joyce Feinberg, 75, Richard Gottfried, 65, Rose Mallinger, 97, Jerry Rabinowitz, 66, brothers Cecil and David Rosenthal, age 59 and 54, a married couple, Bernice Simon, 84, and Sylvan Simon, 86. Daniel Stein, 71. Melvin Wax, 87. And Irvin Younger, 69. These absolute innocents praying in their synagogue were shot with a high capacity rifle by Robert Bowers. Robert Bowers believed in the replacement theory. He bought into the notion that there was this active conspiracy. Here is a quote, the last thing he posted before he went in and murdered all these innocent people. Hyas likes to bring invaders in that kill our people. Hyas is the Hebrew immigrant aid society, an active organization that helps refugees and asylum seekers. It has its roots in the Jewish community. So here, the Jewish community organization kills, likes to bring in invaders. I can't sit by and watch my people get slaughtered. Screw your optics, I'm going in. He believed that war was imminent and it was a war against white people and he was about to be victimized and he justified the slaughter in the name of that theory that is simply a set of allegations and memes on the internet informed by the prejudice and the tropes that we've covered. So this is not harmless by any means. It is not only historical, it is active, it is here, it is now. Next. And as I referenced earlier, it's critical to understand that anti-Semitism is also, or the emergence or re-emergence, the growth of anti-Semitism is a very strong warning. It's a warning about the erosion of democratic norms, of a move to authoritarianism, of an anti-intellectualism, a contempt for science. It's fueled and results in the proliferation of conspiracy theories and the propagation of other forms of bigotry. This was recognized in the UN, where the special rapporteur on our freedom of religion just two years ago called anti-Semitism the canary in the coal mine. Toxic to democracies, a threat to all societies if left unaddressed. Next. And anti-Semitism is political. It is wielded as a political tool by all sides. 
Here you see the protocols of the meetings of the learned elders of Zion. A conspiracy document, a total fabrication, alleging a global conspiracy by Jews to control the world. It has been researched and debunked as early as 1920. It emerged in the early 1900s, by the way, out of Russia. And it alleges that, alleges that these are meeting minutes, if you will, and an agreement on how Jews were going to control the economy, the media, and incite religious conflict. In 1920, Henry Ford republished the protocols in America, something for which he later apologized to the ADL. These were debunked, and yet they live on the internet today. They were on the table outside a chamber in Congress on January 6th. Our own State Department, the US State Department has recognized the, that the clear purpose of the protocols is to incite hatred of Jews and of Israel. And yet it remains and, and new generations are taught that this is a secret document that proves the conspiracy. That conspiracy was adopted, animated, militarized and crafted into a plan to eliminate Jews by Adolf Hitler and the Nazi machine. And yet today, after 6 million Jews were slaughtered, there are people who deny the legitimacy of the Holocaust. And as you see illustrated here, Holocaust denialism referenced on a t-shirt reading Camp Auschwitz appeared among the protesters again in January 6th on Capitol Hill. There is a perverse interrelationship between the authoritarianism, the lack of tolerance, the resistance to democracy and anti-Semitic tropes that lives on and threatens us all. Next. And here are some examples of how the conspiracy lives on on the internet. These are posts for among millions, tens of millions that appear on social media and other platforms on a daily basis, alleging a Zionist conspiracy. And as COVID emerged, arguing that COVID was a Jewish conspiracy, that vaccines are a Jewish conspiracy, that COVID was started by Jews in order to make money off of vaccines that they would invent, that forcing people to be vaccinated was akin to what Hitler did to Jews, making people wear a yellow star. That yellow star designated people for their death. It does not belong in any imagery related to vaccination against COVID. The center of the screen, the ghost Ezra quote, ghost Ezra is one of the most active conspirators as part of QAnon. QAnon has reemerged as one of the most anti-Semitic conspiracy theories that exists online and continues to animate 100,000 views on average for each of his posts. 100,000 views. Next. And let's dive deeper on this Holocaust denialism. And understand that there is no opposing view to the Holocaust. And yet, only two weeks ago, in a school administrators meeting in Texas, we heard an administrator say, well, if you teach the Holocaust, make sure you also include in the curriculum the opposing view. To suggest that there is an opposing view to the existence of the Holocaust 
is anti-Semitic. It's immoral. It's not a matter of opinion. It is fact. And yet, why do we care? We care because less and less people know about the Holocaust. Last year, a survey found that 49% of American adults under the, the age of 40 were exposed to Holocaust denialism or distortion across social media. What people are learning about the Holocaust is as likely to be that it didn't happen as that it did. We, we monitored the gaming space. And we found in a survey last year that 10%, one in 10 American adults encountered Holocaust denialism in games, online games. Next. And there's a generational problem. According to another poll, 56% of millennials and Gen Zs were unable to identify Auschwitz. And there was virtually no awareness of any concentration camp. 6% were familiar with the other killing camps. A quarter knew very little or nothing. And this was echoed in yet another survey among millennials and Gen Z. Gen Z were two thirds, almost two thirds said they had no idea that 6 million Jews were murdered in the Holocaust. This is a warning sign that those of us in education are not doing our jobs. But you are here today and hopefully you will understand the importance that we retain this knowledge because this is what humanity did to humanity, what one people did to another. It must live in our consciousness, not just on behalf of the Jews who died, but on behalf of us all. And we continue to monitor this and we call out social media platforms to remove the content that is simply untrue and we know is dangerous. Next, please. All platforms have now, after discussion with us and others, have committed to take taking Holocaust denialism in one form or another off of their platforms or, or limiting it to, to a large degree. They all have, most of them have explicit policies. Some of them are developing them. And yet, the policies are not sufficient. Here's a recent review that we did through our Center on Technology and Society that shows that the vast majority of platforms either have no action, notwithstanding policies, or have taken very limited action to remove this content. What does this mean? It means every user of Twitch or Twitter, YouTube or TikTok, Facebook or Reddit or any other, is being exposed to Holocaust denialism. Next. The other most active form of anti-Semitism, and this tends to be much more prominent on the far left, is anti-Zionism and anti-Israel bias. And I want you to recall the tropes I want you to remember within the context that a conflict continues, that there is a tragedy, that the Palestinian people and we at ADL have said we are full bore in support of the two-state solution. Even within the context of the conflict, the notion that Israel on the far right of the slide is a baby killer. The notion that Israel, Israel's protection of Jews and its self-determination of the Jewish communities from all over the world that found their way back to the modern state of Israel is equivalent to the Nazi regime. The notion that here in America, two women who sought to march in the Chicago Dyke March with a pride flag that had a Jewish star on it 
are banned, these are unacceptable manifestations of whatever your political view might be, whatever your commitment is to the cause. This is tapping into tropes that are unacceptable in the debate. And I will say again, the ability to criticize the Israeli government is not just the right of anyone, it, Israeli citizens themselves are highly divided and speak out against their government actively. Israel is a active democracy, but it is not what is characterized by many people who adopt these tropes and have their own conspiracy theories against Jews in the one Jewish nation in the world. Next. And this bias was evident and the danger of the absolutism, the illiberalism inherent in some of this critique was on display just a couple of weeks ago here uh, in DC, where there was a voting rights coalition, two Jewish organizations, one part of the, of the Jewish religion, the Jewish reform movement, and the National Association of, or Council of Jewish Women that both of whom have advocated for generations, for voting rights, for choice, for all types of civil rights issues that a local chapter of a climate change organization refused to march alongside a rabbi and a woman from the National Council because they are Zionist organizations? Unacceptable. Not in this country. This is anti Semitism. Next. Now, we are concerned about anti Semitism not just because of history, but because we maintain data that shows that anti Semitism has not gone away and that shows that anti Semitism is, in fact, growing. We, every several years, we do a global poll, scientific poll, based on those tropes. And if you look at the stereotypes that are listed about dual loyalty, Jews have too much power, too much power in finance, they think they're better than other people. It's not, you know, Jews are the reason why people hate Jews, because of the way Jews behave. They talk too much about the Holocaust. They have too much control over global affairs. They only care about themselves. They have too much control over the US government. They have too much control over global media. They're responsible for most of the world's, world's wars. These are just a series of the latest manifestations of those stereotypes. And in global polling, 26% of the people polled agreed with some number of these stereotypes. So this lives in the atmosphere. And I will ask you to reflect. How many of these have you heard? In the forms of jokes or political commentary, the workplace, reflect on that. How many stereotypes about Jews are you exposed to? And do you feel empowered to speak about it, to speak back. Now here in the United States, next. Jews are viewed positively overall in relative terms. 69% of those polled felt warmly towards Jews. And yet 40% of the respondents the adults who responded to our survey believed multiple anti-Semitic statements to be true. And 11%, over one in 10 people believed six or more stereotypes in the United States of America. That is a flashing warning light. Next. And 
it's not just attitudes, it is action. Two years ago, we saw the largest number, or in 2019, we saw the largest number of anti-Semitic incidents in the 42 years that, of our audit here in the United States of anti-Semitic incidents. In 2017, the year of Charlottesville, we saw a one year 57% rise in incidents. And we saw another 12% increase. And in 2020, we saw a slight decline but it was still the third highest year on record. And these incidents are assaults, they are harassment, they are defacement of places of worship, vandalism, they are comments in schools, comments on campus, comments in the workplace that are re reported it to us and where we have sufficient evidence to include in our audit. Next. And it is right here in the DMV. In 2020, we had 47 anti-Semitic incidents reported to us. That means every week, some person in Maryland is being harassed as a Jew. And that's just what's reported to us. And that represented more than doubling over the year prior. In 2020, it was, Maryland was the 11th highest number of incidents in the country. And the amount of harassment was materially up. So this is not just in places where perhaps you would assume that tolerance is less. This is happening in our own backyard. Next. And a subcategory of incidents are hate crimes. Now, hate crimes are actual crimes that can be demonstrated to have been committed with a racial or religious or identity motivation or animus. So the victim was targeted or the institution was targeted on the basis of its immutable characteristic, its religion, its race, its ethnicity, its gender, gender identity, gender preference. And these are reported through police departments, investigated, the vast majority actually are not reported, but from those that are, the second largest category, always the largest categories on the basis of race, always for decades, it has been African-Americans in America who bear the brunt of the largest category of incidents. It's very important to remember that, that the incidents against the African-American community are consistently the highest of any group. The basis of, of hate, is race, and this is violence or vandalism on the basis of their race. The second largest category is religion. And 60% of the religious-based hate incidents or hate crimes are against Jews. 60% against 2% of the population. Next. That 60% of race cr of crimes overall, I'm sorry, of, of religious based crimes represents 12% of the whole on 2% of the population, six times. And understand, and for any, any of you who have ever suffered from an insult or, an, or something worse, I hope not, uh, on the basis of your identity, or when you see something happen to somebody else in a community with which you identify, you understand that the crime is not just committed against you as an individual. The crime is committed against the whole community. That's the intent. The intent is to intimidate, to harass, to send a message that you and your kind don't, do not belong. And that's why we have special hate crime laws. That's why ADL itself wrote the model hate crime law. And we have been involved in a decades long campaign to institute hate crime laws in all 50 states. We're not quite there yet. We've got Georgia this past year. There's still three states to go. Next. And so we understand attitudes, we understand incidents, and now we poll Jewish Americans' experience with anti-Semitism. And this is in a poll that was done just recently 
The question being over the past five years, have you experienced or witnessed any form of anti-Semitic act? More than half of Jews in America have experienced or witnessed it in the last five years. Half of Jews have heard comments, slurs, threats, and 20% have been the target themselves. So the reality of Jewish experience today in America, starting from before Charlottesville, but if we take Charlottesville as a particularly animating point, remember that video, that was on everybody's television screens, that there is emerging this notion that Jews are responsible for all the ills in the world. And now we see the incidents going up. We have Jews experiencing it going up. We see the violence inherent in the ideology. We see the violence happening on the basis of identity and religious identity. This is the lived experience of Jews today. It is not analogous to Nazi Germany. It is not analogous to the Russian pogroms. It is not analogous to many things that have happened. But it is an outrage notwithstanding that. And it is a reality. And that reality is important for all of us to understand if for no other reason that we're in conversation, that we come to conversation with knowledge. I ask people to learn about others. I have taken upon myself to understand to the extent that I can the lived experience of other religions, other races, other ethnicities, and genders and gender identities as part of being a member of society, as part of strengthening our civil society. And while it may not be the first of mind or it may not be something that folks think is an important priority, we believe that Jewish historical experience and this reemergence in our own backyard in all the forms merits each of us looking at our knowledge and engaging in fighting back. Next. And the campus experience is by no, no means immune. With the Hillel organization, we just conducted a survey over the last few months. And on campus, a third of students say that they personally experienced anti-Semitism on their campus. And 43 experienced or witnessed activity that was anti-Semitic. So this is a reality on campuses. It's a reality in the broader community. Next. And finally, hate and harassment is the true viral threat to our democracy in its online form. Hate and harassment is growing. Just last year, 41% of Americans who res responded to our survey said they experienced online harassment. And that included over a third of Jews. And I, if you're interested in this area, this is the area of, of I think, a very substantial threat where we need to demand more of the social media companies. Please look at our online materials from our Center on Technology and Society, where we are both monitoring, calling for action, and coming up with new solutions to deal with the proliferation of hate. If you ask what is different today from the hate that has always been or that has manifested itself in our own American past or, or in other past, it is the internet. That is the difference. It is re-emerging, educating new generations because nobody is in charge. Anything can be said, and as we are now finding out through or affirming through the leaks and the testimony of Facebook former employees, the algorithms actually push it. Because if it's controversial, it brings eyes. If it brings eyes, it brings revenue. And we, in last, last year, organized a campaign to expose Facebook, to pressure Facebook, to deal with this problem. And ultimately, we believe it will, it will be up to Congress. But each of us can identify hate online, report hate, call it out, call those who are proliferating it out, and do our part 
to try to protect what should be a good for humanity, not an ill. Next. Here is a graphic. That is the United States under, under it. This represents just in this year, all of the reported incidents of hate, hate crimes, anti-Semitism, distribution of white supremacist or other hate literature. This is the map of America that we are concerned about. Next. As an example, we are seeing unprecedented white supremacist propaganda being distributed across the country and on campus. It's the highest amount we've ever seen. With COVID on campus, it dropped, but early indications are it's coming back. If you see this, report it. Report it to us. Report it to campus officials. We are not suggesting that people don't have First Amendment rights, but violent calls to violence, calls to eliminate people are unacceptable. And each of us has a responsibility to fight back. Next. And each of us has a responsibility to the other because each of us has a shared identity. And within white supremacy, it's critical to understand that the very root of it, the core of white supremacy is actually anti-Semitism. That white supremacy supposes that Jews are the other. And that in order to understand white supremacy and the way it's been yielded against Jews, and of course against African Americans and Latinx community and Asian American community, every other community, anti-Semitism is integral to that understanding. And here is the quote from Eric Ward, who's a leading civil rights advocate, who is actively pointing out that as it has for centuries, at the core of white supremacy is this notion of Jews as demons stirring up a pod of lesser evils. Next. And it is the fuel that white supremacists use to power its anti-black racism, its contempt for all people of color and misogyny and all the forms of hatred. And thus we must work together to tear it down. Next. I've talked about hate. I've talked about the depressing statistics. I've talked about the calls to action. What I wanna make sure you understand is that we at the ADL have studied this for over a hundred years. That we understand and we have demonstrated in history that there is a pyramid of hate. There is a construct and it is critical that we interrupt the progression from the base to the peak. It is critical for all of us to engage in this work. The pyramid shows bias behaviors that grow in complexity and impact from the bottom to the top. And although the behaviors at each level negatively impact individuals and groups as you move up the pyramid, the pyramids have more life-threatening consequences. The upper levels though, as in a physical pyramid, are absolutely supported by the lower levels. And if people or institutions treat behaviors on the lower levels as being acceptable or normal, it means that the behaviors at the next level become more acceptable. If you want to know where genocide comes from, the pyramid of hate demonstrates that that level of hate, whether in the Holocaust or any other form of genocide that occurs or is still occurring, is built from the acceptance of behaviors associated with the other levels. Now it's not designed to suggest in ranking how serious each level or behavior is. The experience of the victim at any level is unacceptable. 
But it does demonstrate that when you accept one level of behavior, it becomes easier to accept the next level. The normalization of hate, the mainstreaming of hate, and most violent and horrific manifestations of prejudice at the top of the pyramid had their beginnings in the thinking described at the lower part of the pyramid. And so this pyramid should serve as a symbol, as a challenge for all manifestations of hate. Biased attitudes, stereotypes, trying to justify biases, not understanding the lived experience of others, lacking self-reflection or awareness of, of one's privilege or that one's beliefs are beliefs and that others have beliefs as well, leads to acts of bias or an acceptance of acts of bias, of microaggressions, of jokes, of appropriation, of exclusion and ridicule, of dehumanization, which in turn can justify disparities on a more systemic basis, criminal justice, school resources, housing, employment, wages, voter restrictions. And that systemic discrimination leads incalculably, inevitably to bias motivated violence in the form of the threats I referenced and the desecration, the vandalism, assaults, murder, terror. And if allowed to proliferate and systematize, it can and has in our history resulted in genocide. So please keep in mind this construct that if you were engaging if you're challenging a remark online, if you're challenging a joke, if you're suggesting somebody is insensitive with an open heart and with an attitude of wanting to understand and accept, you are doing the work at the base of the pyramid. And it is critical work. And it is each of our responsibility to engage in that. And now let me just finish up with a few comments about how we fight. So we fight hate for good, as I reflected earlier, referenced earlier through understanding where hate is, how it manifests, how it's growing. We call, the, call out the alarm, we expose the hate. It used to be that the, the best way to extinguish hate was to shine a light. That's no longer the case. People gladly demonstrate their hate in public, but we need to understand where the hate is, how it's growing, and when it turns to action. And then, most critically, we need to work in partnership with others in all of our education institutions, with all of society, to demonstrate whether it's through our Echoes and Reflections program, Teaching the Holocaust, or anti-Semitism uncovered, going through the tropes and the historical basis of anti-Semitism, our anti-bias education in world of difference, our anti-Semitism education on words to action on campus, or our newest program, a self-directed online program called BNA, Building Insights to Navigate Anti-Semitism and Hate, which is a self-directed digital lesson on the history that I've referenced today. These are all vehicles. They're all available to you to learn, to people who you think could utilize them. It is important that we re-engage in education. Education is the antidote. And some days it feels like it's the only antidote. And as we do that next, we implore those of you who are civically minded to help us engage in what we call our protect plan, which we launched after January 6th, where we prioritize the prevention of domestic terrorism. We ensure that there are resources commensurate with the threat. We oppose extremists in government service. We take domestic prevention or terrorism prevention measures, end the complicity of social media in facilitating this extremism, create an independent clearinghouse, which is still an aspiration for online extremist content, and also understand that this is a growing international cross-border threat 
and the need to target foreign terrorist groups. Next. And what you can do is to engage with us or engage with other organizations with whom we partner and beyond. We have a number of ways in which you can demonstrate your commitment to fight hate, our walk against hate, which just passed, never is now, the world's largest conference. We had over 10,000 registrants. It, it completes this evening, if you want to tune in this evening. The vice president addressed us on Sunday evening to begin. We are upcoming our concert against hate, where we elevate regular people who have stood against hate in really courageous ways. That will be a free streamed concert on the evening of Sunday, December 12th. As I referenced, please, if you see a problem, report it. Report it to us, report it to authorities if you're comfortable. We have internship opportunities. We have a leadership development program. We are in the community and here is a resource. So I think we probably know the answer to this poll, but let's do one more real quickly before we take your questions. Well, it gives me great pleasure to see that folks already knew or maybe perhaps picked up something from this uh, conversation, this discussion so far. I would like, I'd like to end on that note and uh, begin to take your questions. But before that, one more personal reflection. Might surprise you to see this young child. This is my cousin, Alexander. Within a year of this picture, Alexander was murdered with his mother at Auschwitz. He's the cousin I never met. The memory of the Holocaust has to be preserved. It is real, it lives in millions of people in America. If you ask a question of a Jewish family, you no doubt will hear a story of some type of oppression or survival. America represents such a wonderful respite, a place of enormous value and potential for so many immigrants. My family story, I'm the first born, first generation American on this side of my family. And I'm here because while my cousin's mother did not survive, my grandmother did. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Duran. We're just grateful to you for this. Um deep dive into a topic that many of our students don't fully understand and want to. You have really um, brought so much to us. We've learned a great deal. And I think one of the big lessons here is the open offer that you have for partnership going forward for education, for supportive services, for training for our faculty and students. Um, we'll be, we will continue the conversation. We have much to learn. And I think that our everyday actions do need to um, really meet. It's not just a moment. We apparently are in an era of increased hate. And um, I just am so grateful to you. And I know that we all are. Um, so this brings to the close the seventh annual Bella Mishkinski Memorial Lecture. And I thank the um, Frank Islam Athenaeum Symposium of Sirius series here at Montgomery College for hosting this event. Thank you, Duran. Uh, thank you to your colleagues at ADL, uh, Brielle Hill and Maria Slade. Uh, and thank you to Ken Jassy, who is the Holocaust Education Coordinator here at Montgomery College and has been doing this for a decade and doing it beautifully. Thank you all and have a lovely afternoon. Uh -huh.